G'day and welcome back. Today I've got something a little bit different. It's two Grundig powered speaker boxes. This is one of them. The other one's up on my bench ready to work on. A very attractive looking unit for 1960. It would have been really nice then. I found a date code on one of them that was 1961. There's four knobs along the top here. One's on off, one's volume, one's bass and one's treble. Unfortunately, this is a time when Grundy had switched to using particle board as their case material and this has been affected by water. So I've got one on my bench. We'll go and have a look at that. I'm at my workbench and here's the other one with the back off it. It has two speakers. That one looks maybe 10 inch and there's another little mid range up the top there. Over on the side here is the amplifier. Uh, this is a ECC 83 and that's an EL84 I think. Now, after a lot of searching I found a schematic for it. It's not exactly the right one but it, I think it'll be identical actually. It's just out of a different speaker. The gentleman that owns this bought this on a marketplace or something like that and he did plug one in and I think he said it blew a fuse. Well I'm not sure if it's the fuse in here or his house fuse but I think what I need to do is remove it and have a look inside. Alright I've got it all out. It was a bit harder than I thought. I had to take all the tone controls out which I hadn't thought of. It's a two valve set, although this one's got two sections of one valve, so it's kind of a three valve. I assume that'll be a preamp, two preamps in there, and then you've got your EL84 as the main amplifier. There's a small transformer, there's a uh, capacitor there, which will be 250s, I think. Don't see it. Oh, 2 by 50 there. Yeah. And it's got a rather spiffy looking crossover network on top of the output transformer here. Uh, they've got coils, they haven't just put a cap in there. I'll turn it over and see what's underneath. Here's the underside. Um, there's a selenium rectifier there. Not much else happening down here. There's a fuse in this container here. Uh, up the top there's a paper. Paper. There's a Phillips. Oh, that's not even attached. Ah, there you go. Uh, another paper one, I think. Yeah, both papers. They're all EROs. Uh, there's an electrolytic. I'll change that. I'll change the paper ones, of course. There's a styro. Yeah, not much else to do. So. Well, that's odd that it's got a floating connection there. So not too much happening up there. Uh, I will replace the selenium of course. I've got these small bridge rectifiers and I'll just put one of those in. That'll just pick up one of the bolts and just put the wires on. That'll be very easy. But before I do anything, I'm going to put some power on. We'll see where the smoke comes from. Okay, I'm all set up here. I have my phone here ready to put some music in if it's going to work. I've set the uh, voltage at 2 20 odds, that's what it's rated at. I've got it on a dim bulb. We'll see what happens. Keep an eye on the light. And that's not too bad. It's not full bright. It's fairly bright though. It's dragged the voltage down to 140 odd, which is a lot. And it's 31 watts going in. I wouldn't think this would be rated at 31 watts. The selenium rectifier hasn't blown up. There's some noise in the speaker. So something's working, but something is pulling too much power there. It's been about five minutes now. The bulb's almost gone out. We're up to 172 volts. This has dropped a couple of amps, uh, watts to uh, about 29 on this. I think it was 31 point something. It has got a bit of an odour. Something's not happy. The selenium's there, I think. And that's, that's cold. That bulb is warm. That one's warm. It does make a noise. I'll turn it off. Oh, <laughs> I'll tell you what, that capacitor is hot. That is very, very hot. Yuch. Okay. Right, what I think I'll do is let this cool off. We'll run this again in about 10 minutes or something. See if it gets hot again. And maybe it'll work. This, I'd totally forgotten that was hanging off loose like that. I think it goes there, but looking at the bottom of it, if it was attached there, it's had the very smallest amount of solder holding it. Uh, what have we got there? 4700 picofarad. So I'll see if I can find it on the schematic. It's coming off pin 1 of the ECC83. Here is one half of the ECC83. And pin 1 is the plate. And it goes off. It goes through a capacitor. That's a blocking capacitor. And it heads off to get shaped up by the tone controls here. So that'll be it there. But that's 1.5 nanofarad. That has to be that capacitor. It's got the wrong one in it and it's not connected. So I wouldn't have got any sound if I wanted to. I'll put in a 1.5 nanofarad or a 0, oh, hang on that's going to be, it'll have to be a 0 0.002 microfarad. So I'll unsolder this one. 
I'll see if I can clear the hole there. We might be able to get a get the capacitor in there. Now the other end goes here. This is going off to the tone shaping or the bass and treble. And I think I can find a little hole there somewhere. There it is. If I have that about where I want it, I can read the data on the side of the capacitor. So I'll just solder those on there. Alright, it's up the right way. I uh, will have another shot at it. It's still on dim bulb. And I expect that this will work much better. Virtually no bulb at all. 177. Oh! Jolly! Wow, that scared me to death, that thing. Um, yeah, it sounds good. Wow, what's that star skin hutch? Try something else. Well, it sounds terrible, um, but it does work. All the bits are going to work. Just needs all those parts changed. The, um, there'll be another coupling capacitor. There's probably another two coupling capacitors, and they're probably shot too, so that'll be causing that distortion. I was going to just bulk replace all these capacitors, um, but then I thought, I've changed that one there. That's a coupling capacitor, and there's another one here. Wherever there's a grid, there'll be a capacitor in front of it. There it is. And there's a grid, there's a capacitor. So I thought maybe, why don't we change those two and see what difference it makes and if it gets rid of that distortion. Uh, and there's the grid. The grid will be pin 7. It's a bit hard to see it. It's under there somewhere. That's pin 7, 8, 9. Yes, that's 7. It's coming over here. There's, that'll be the capacitor there. I'll put a new 0 0.0033 in there. I've put a new capacitor in there. Uh, the one that came out was a 0.022. And the one on the schematic says 0 0.033. So I've gone with what was in there. That's obviously the original cap. The schematic I'm using is this chassis, but um, it's a different version. So little things will be different. So I'll put in what was in there. Let's try that again. So put some power on again. Still on dim bulb. Oh, still sounds awful. Sounds better. Actually, it sounds alright. No, no, it's still got the distortion. Alright. I'll turn that off. I'll change the other capacitor. The remaining coupling capacitor is this one here. Uh, that's it there. That's a 0 0.033. The new capacitor is in. I'll try that out. Alright, let's have another go. I have some music running still. I reckon it'll be alright. Ooh, no, it still sounds awful. Might be the song. Ooh, a lot of hum there. A lot of hum. Oops. Wow. I just tried to turn these... Oh, no. Uh, yeah, they're not moving. They're not... They are frozen solid. I've got a different song, and it does make it sound a bit better. Though. So that's getting there. Uh, it's pretty good actually. I'll just change the rest of the components. I'll have to have a look at these two controls though. They're frozen solid. Just as a matter of interest, this capacitor is red hot. Well, it's not red hot, but it's very hot. I'll disconnect it and I'll put two new capacitors underneath. All right, I've done a bit of work here. I did intend showing it, but the computer failed. I've reinstalled the operating system, so I've lost that bit of video. I've mounted the two capacitors here on this tag strip. I've soldered and bolted the tag strip down to the chassis. And I'm just going to do this uh, rectifier, the selenium rectifier. And I'm thinking of mounting the new diode rectifier here somewhere and just connect the wires up, a bit of heat shrink. And I think that'll be pretty good. The first thing I'll do is just transfer these wires over. That's exactly how it is there, the same as those. So it's just a matter of connecting those on. A bit of heat shrink and then I'll mount it on the chassis. That's all done again. I need a standoff in here to hold this power wire. But everything else fitted in nicely. These uh, capacitors uh, look pretty good. They're nice and neat in the corner there. These two are C solid. The only thing that's moving there is the knob. 
I'll undo the knob. Uh, I put some WD-40 on both of these, let them soak for a while, see if it'll come loose. There's a circlip here, I'll see if I can get that off, and then I can get the penetrant right around the shaft. There you go. I'll give these a spray. So I'll let that sit for a while, and they should come loose. I've left these for about five minutes, which probably is not enough. Wow, they are solid. Is it giving? Something. No, the whole thing's turning. I'll give them another squirt. Maybe I'll have to leave these overnight. This has been soaking for quite a number of hours, and I don't think it's going to move. I did try it a bit before. Okay, it's not budging. Um, I might try a bit of heat on it, perhaps. All right, I've got well, I've got about 300 degrees going into that. This may destroy the potentiometer, but I can put a new one on. All right, that should be hot enough. Let's give it a go. Wow, that loosened it straight away. Look at that. So the old garage turntable method worked fine. Ah, all right. So I might as well do this one as well, and the other two on the other speaker are exactly the same. They won't move. I didn't give that one anywhere near as long as the other one, so I'll see if that's worked. Yeah, it just comes, yeah, look at that, straight away. All right, that's excellent. Learn something every day. I've soaked that in WD-40, it's very tight, and as it cools off, it uh, goes hardy, it'll actually almost seize up again. So I guess I'll keep working it. I'll try this one again. Yes, it's very tight, very tight. This has been sitting and soaking for 12 hours. That one's loose, but it's not right. This one, you can't move again. The problem is not that it's got gummed up lubricant in there. I think the um, these cast aluminium housings have you know deformed so what I'm going to do is remove one of them I'll pull it apart and see if I can fix it and uh, put it back together again I want to take this phenolic sheet off then I'll be able to push the shaft back I've cleaned up the damage to the shaft so it should go back now I'll just put it in the vise and you can see it's got a tiny rivet in each corner so I think I'll just file them off I'm doing a bit of damage to that phenolic sheet there. I'll just try drilling this one. Trying to drill it didn't work. It did exactly what I thought it would do, which is why I was going to file it. Anyway, we'll go back to taking the top off of the file. I've got a finer file this time. That's better. Won't do quite so much damage to the phenolic. Okay. I should have put a mark on there so I can put it back in the right place. Two of the rivets are formed by the actual casting itself. So I will try and remove those so I can sit this flat to knock the shaft through. There's also a little locator tab for the phenolic sheet, so I didn't need to mark it. Now, there's a very good chance this could fail miserably. I'll heat the uh, casing so that hopefully it'll almost fall through. Now, I'll hold it there with my oven mitt. Here it goes. There it goes. I put a big bag of rags under it, so it fell onto the rag. There's the shaft. It's fed fairly well. I'm guessing this casting's warped a little bit and that hole's just gone oval or, or something. So I'll just try and re-drill it and should be able to put it back together again. I'll measure the shaft and it's going to be 6mm. All right. This is a 6mm drill. I, uh, it's going to be the same. Um, you need a bit of clearance. I think that'll just go straight in. Yeah, look. It does seem to be catching. <laughs> well, 
what I'll do is try and hone it out. I've put a split down a rather large chopstick here and wrapped a little bit of uh, sandpaper around it. And that should go on there. All right. So if I just do that to hone it in, I can get a bit more diameter out of it. Let's try that now. Oh, nice. <laughs> All right. All I've got to do now is work out how to put the top back on. I bought these on eBay a while ago. They're little um, hollow rivets like that. Now the packet also contains little tiny ones and these are exactly the right size for that potentiometer. I've got a little rivet in there and I've got the center punch sitting on top. I'm pushing the whole thing together. There's spring loaded of course. I'll just flatten that out. Sorry about that. Wow, that's nice. So I'll try and get the other rivet in. All right. I have two rivets in now. These ones here, there's no holes. They were extrusions in the casting that went through the little hole and they'd riveted it over. So I'll drill these out and uh, try and put some more rivets in. Uh, the four rivets are in and it's quite secure. It works beautifully. It's very smooth. I put a little bit of grease in here as well and uh, there's no wobble. There's no shaft wobble. It's it's perfectly fine. So that's a good outcome for that. Now people are saying, why don't you just buy new ones? They're, they're too big in diameter. Uh, the ones I get that are smaller are about oh, a half an hour drive each way plus about $40 in fuel and I might as well just stay here in the air conditioning and uh, fix these ones. I've changed the other three or four capacitors that needed changing. I've put the potentiometer back on here. I didn't need to do that potentiometer. I just kept working at it. Eventually it came free. So they're both about the same. So they're done. I've got it on dim bulb again. Now I will just drop the power back a little there because I've taken the selenium rectifier out and just put a diode rectifier in it. So the voltage drop isn't anywhere near as much. I have my voltmeter here and it's measuring the output of the silicon rectifier. I'll put this on, dim bulb again. I'll put a little screwdriver in the DIN plug down here. That's working. So the amp's working. Uh, what have we got? Now we're supposed to have 280 or 279. Uh, I'm going to put it on full voltage. I've got 268. I'll turn the voltage up a bit. And what have we got there? 282. That's pretty close. So it's putting in about 212 volts to get the correct B+. So there's two issues really. The initial one is that this used to run on 220. I'm going to now run it at 240, which means that this B plus voltage is going to go up and so will the filament voltages. So to counter that 220, 240 discrepancy, the easiest way to do it is to just put a resistor in here somewhere. So that'll take care of the filament voltage. I still need to come up with some way of dealing with the increased B plus. I've done a quick Ohm's law calculation and it's usually about 100 ohms. I've only got 100 ohms, I don't have much either side of that. So I'm going to put that in. I think that'll be just about right. Now, of course, this resistor is going to get very, very hot. So I'll mount it on the chassis there so that the chassis can pull the heat away. I've made a little bracket up and drilled some holes. I have a bit of heat sink here. I'm going to mount this on top of the chassis just to get the heat out of the chassis. I've tapped a couple of holes in the bottom there. So that'll fit underneath and then I'll screw into it from here. So I'll place that there. I've got heatsink compound on that. I've put the two screws through. So I'll pick this one up here. And this one as well. I've got some heatsink compound on here. Now, of course, this is a massive overkill. You don't have to do anything like this. I just like getting the heat away from everything. All right, there's one screw. And there's the other one. All right, there it is, even if it doesn't work, it looks cool. Uh, this is the wire from the fuse going to the switch, so I'll lift that off there, connect it here, I'll connect this wire back over to here. I've connected all the wires there. I've put this back on dim bulb. Uh, what have we got, 241 there, 242. I've got this DMM connected to the filament windings, 
and there's another one here that's going over to this one over here and that's measuring the B plus so everything's going okay I'll put it on full power we've got 240 volts and 6.3 so it's not bad on here we've got 288 what do we want 280 so the B plus is still a bit high so I can adjust that I'll just see how it goes because I haven't tried it since I put the new capacitors in right the phone's connected up well, that sounds pretty good so that's the volume yeah and one of these is bass and one's treble that's the ones I repaired so that's working and I think that must yeah it's bass yeah, working perfectly good I do need to address that slightly high B plus. I'll do that now. All right, um, I've been experimenting a bit. I thought I had a current limiter I was going to try in there. I can't find it. No, it's here somewhere. Anyway, I've resorted back to using uh, resistors. I've dropped the B plus to 279, which is exactly what it's supposed to be. Well, so that was a bit of luck more than anything. I assume they're trying to get 250 volts on the plate of the output valve, and I think I'm on it there. It should be that blue wire. And we've got 258. Yeah, okay. That's fine. The, what, that valve will take 300 volts, but they generally run at about 250. I'll just see how hot that resistor is getting. It'll be around 50 odd, I would think. Oh, no, it's only 44, so that's fine. That resistor will be fine. Here's the big one I put in, and that's running at 56 or 7 or something around there. Uh, that's about exactly where I want it. So that's good. I'm happy with the way that's working. I will take all this stuff off. I'll mount the two little white resistors on the chassis somewhere. They're not getting hot at all. And I'll have to reposition the clamp with the mains wires coming in. I've mounted those two resistors. I've just made a very simple little bracket to hold them down. And I also machined a little boss there, a little spacer. So I'll turn it over. We'll give it a try. I've got it the right way up. It's all set up. It's ready to go. I've put the power on. And there's a switch here. I'll turn it on here, make sure the switch works. There it goes. I've got a bit of music from Carmen. I'll turn that up. There. Yeah. Clear as a bell, working very, very nicely. I'll turn it off here so I don't electrocute myself. I've got 240 volts sitting here. Yeah, you've got to be careful all the time. All right, that looks good. Um, I will go and do exactly the same thing to the other one. I won't show that, of course. I'll put them both in their cases and we'll give it a try out. I originally said I was going to put these back in the case and then try them out, but I thought I'd show you before I did that and explain a few things. So there's the two of them finished. They are pretty much identical. I made another cooling fin up and it's exactly the same as this one over here. Uh, I've changed all the capacitors as I did in here. This one had the original capacitors in it, and uh, there was only one that was different to the schematic. So I will update the schematic. Here's the casualty list here, and that's out of both of them. Quite a, quite a few parts in there, actually. This is the chassis I've just finished. Um, I pretty much just hoed in and changed everything. I did try it before I pulled it apart, and the capacitor over there was getting super hot. It was started to smoke, actually, and it wouldn't work at all. You could just hear a faint bit of sound getting through. So I turned it off and just changed all the parts and turned it back on and it works exactly the same as this. They are identical. The potentiometers here, this is the one I did the other day, that's the one I pulled apart. This is the one that I managed to free up. Now these are the two that I've just finished, so they're working well. Uh, what I ended up doing was applying some heat to the case like I did before with the other one, uh, put some WD-40 in there and kept working it. If it started to seize up again I put a bit more heat on it and just kept working it, it eventually came free. So uh, if you're doing one of these or have this sort of potentiometer somewhere, you can get it to work without pulling it apart. What I'm going to do now is put both of these back in their cases, seal it all up and try them out. I think it's going to be interesting. I think they should have a really good sound. I came up with a small problem. I've put this back in its case, put the big speakers on and on high volume there was a bit of a 50 hertz buzz from the power supply. So. I was concerned about putting this resistor here. Uh, it's quite close to, um, you know, all the inputs for the for the uh, valve here. Um, I thought this was going to ground this one, but it's actually not. This is the uh, grid for the ECC eighty three. 
um, so I've got it right next to that. So I'm going to lift that and just perhaps just wire it directly across here or something, get it out of the way. It's picking it up off this, I'm pretty sure. There it is there, I've just soldered straight onto the end of the resistor. The resistor is quite stable, it'll be fine sitting there. So I'll see how it goes. If it's a problem, I'll come back, otherwise I'll put it back in the case. I've put everything back in the cabinet, I've got the backs on the cabinet, they're all finalised. The 50 hertz hum is gone, so moving that connection fixed that problem. I'll do a little bit of a test, I've got my Yeti microphone somewhere. Where, oh, there it is. Yeah, I'll pick that up later. So this is recorded using the Yeti microphone and nothing else, it's just, this is it. It's just the way it is and it's picked it up pretty well. So I'll turn them on and we'll have a listen. There you go, a little bit of fun looking back at the 60s and testing out the speakers. The speakers aren't hi-fi, they're 1960s tech, they sound like 1960s tech. They're pretty good, but you know, they wouldn't compare with what we have today. Anyway, a fun little project and a little bit different to fixing radios. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. This just a hand, this is from the local supermarket chain Coles, and they've put out a chicken flavoured with Vegemite and a cheesy stuffing. We're approaching Australia Day here, so I assume this is a limited release for Australia Day. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's probably all right. It's got salty Vegemite savoury flavours. So. Anyway, I'll see how I go with that. I'm not sure if I'm going to buy one or not. No, I'll probably buy one. Anyway, thanks for joining me again, and I hope you enjoyed watching this little repair of these two speakers, and I hope you can join me next time for my next radio adventure.